All right, people, what's going on? Real Tough Talk, right back at you. We just finished talking about that first segment, talking about Javon. That was real interesting. Now we're going to talk about the next play, the one I really wanted to talk about. We're going to talk about the UFL reigning MVP, formerly of Riot Squad, Lou. This guy balled out last year. Got to give him his props, man. He did his thing. Six touchdowns, four interceptions, various huge plays. He really had a nice coming out party last season. And he did it by beating other candidates that were also on level to be MVP. Yeah, he yeah. beat Vic, who had, I would say, better numbers than, than Lou. Okay. Well, uh, let's just say more numbers. Okay. Because he had seven um, touchdowns instead of six. Right. He had five sacks and an interception. So right. he was a bigger part of their defense. Right. Okay. But the difference with that is... Interception is called turnovers. And yes. it gives you more possessions. And not only that, because Vic was such was on a team that was so successful overall, yeah, he had, had a loss. lot of guys that were all-star level players on their team. A lot of guys that stepped up on that Rep City team, and that was why they were undefeated up until a certain point in the season. And Charlie won coach of the year. Yes, and that is why they did. They had such a good season. So it's hard and to to give a person an MVP when the whole team is. Doing I think well. yeah, I think he his team kind of hurt him. And then you had um, Shannon. Um, Shannon was basically. Everything for ninety nine last season. Yes, and not only and, and not only as a superstar, as a leader. Yeah, he brought the same. I think he took more control. We show his leadership because he plays for the U. We never saw that leadership role because yeah. you got Swiss in front of you. You don't really gotta be the leader. Um, he played, I think, with Dem Getters. Yeah, um, and you don't really see that again because Hollywood do that. Mm -hmm. Ninety nine needed him to step up. And he did that. He didn't have, I think what hurt him in the MVP running, he didn't have a jump out the building type numbers. But he kept everybody in position for this team to be successful. If I would have told you in the beginning of the season, 99 problems, after going 2-8 and eight, mm -hmm. the previous season, would be in a championship, you would never believe well, one thing I got to say on that is the East, that, that division was all over the place. It was a battle just to survive in Are that division. Are you saying that the Eastern that Conference was a tough division. is like the NBA no, Eastern Conference? Listen, I'm saying that it was a tough division. Every team was competing to stay alive in that division. Okay. And 99 scraped through with the first place mark in that division. But they didn't have the, the record that would say, oh, that's a team that's a definite contender for the championship. Right. They were, I believe, four and five. Mm -hmm. I think there was five. I'll find out their numbers yes, right yes. now. But you can go ahead. Keep going. My thing is, they didn't have a number that jumped, that jumped to you and say, that's a championship team. So a lot that Shannon did was to keep them together, to keep them surviving in that division. Correct. And a lot of times we see when a person takes on a captain role, they were the five leader and four. role. Yes, so five, five and four. four. Yeah, my my numbers are reversed. But when they take that leadership role, it kind of hurts their numbers a little bit. Okay. Because you're not able to focus on just doing what you do. You know, being that star. When you're worried about everybody else's job and trying to get True. everybody. To We've do seen their Danny roles. from Carver goes yes. through that. Yep. So my thing is, a captain sometimes hurts their own personal numbers. You know, I mean, we have, we can debate about certain things that happened with the NBA, with the whole Kevin Durant talk right. about why he went to Golden State. But it's the same thing. When you lose that leadership role and you're able to just do what you do, you're able to shine more on the field. And that's one thing that um, Shannon lacked that season because he was that leader. And then you had B-Roy. Um, B-Roy was another nominee. Um, B-Roy had a great season. I think he had, of all time, had the most... You was on a you got Moss more than any other player yeah. in one season. That guy dominated, and I and I take it personal because I kind of called him out, and I and I was critical on him, and and I was like, you know, he's not a top player because he's he's inconsistent. Mm -hmm. That guy took that, and that's a six four. Yeah. Man, and he took that personal, and he dominated. You know, his numbers. Another one that wasn't. Lights out the build as far as touchdowns because when you sharing the ball with Alex, Prince Mo, Kenny, A B, Mace, it's a lot of weapons on there. So his numbers wasn't jump out the building, but he mm. definitely showed us. Well, you got before more I get into you know my, my words for B Roy, I just gotta say you said he's a six four man. I didn't know that he was anything else. You know? No, so. no, no. You know what I mean? <laughs> this guy 
is a 6'4". I don't want to say man child because they call Alex that. Yeah. But this guy is a 6'4 beast created in the basement. The yeah. things that he's able to do, and I'm not a B-Roy fan. Mm. I love him as a dude. Good dude. You know, I got a good friendship with B-Roy. But as far as a player, he talks trash. He has a beard that I can't grow. So I'm not a big B-Roy fan. Mm -hmm. But facts is facts. And this guy, the, the, the way he's able to be 6'4", with that size, play defensive line and tackle, and still able to guard a guy like Shannon and one of these guys lowered to the ground is amazing. And I'm going to say with that, that is one of the reasons why he was on that list. And he was a shoo-in. Well, I'm not going to say a shoo-in because he didn't win the, um, the MVP. But he was definitely deserving to be there because he was one of the anchors on their offense. Yeah. When and push he's comes a defensive to, captain. Yes. This is crazy. So when push came to shove this year, that, that season, when Dion needed somebody to get the ball, Dion, I mean... B-Roy was there. Because Alex kind of, he didn't have a great season. Yeah. He balled out, but he kind of came midway through the season. But listen, so it was Alex had a good season. I'm not going to say he did it, but B-Roy was definitely yeah. their main target Correct. that season. And when I say almost everything that was thrown B-Roy's way, way, he caught. And I think that was motivation from what you said. I agree. So, so that is why he was definitely on the list. I, but getting back to our main, you know, Yeah, we were talking topic, about Lou. We're, we're These are the people he beat. Yeah. Yes. We're, you know, giving out all of our critiques and our and our opinions of these people, people because yep. these are all people that Lou beat this se that season to become MVP, and that yeah. says something about how important yeah. he was to that riot squad team. Well, before we talk, I I I had a nice one on one sit down with Lou. You know, we had our first ever in house interview. And um, that's going to be great. And he said a lot of questionable things. So we're going to go to the footage of that. And we'll be right back after the interview. This is Stephen J. One-on-one -on -one with Lou, man-to-man. -man. We'll be right back. What's going on, people? Stephen J. here with the first in-house interview with the reigning UFL MVP, Mr. Lou. How you doing, brother? Good. Uh, um, all's well. It's a beautiful opportunity, you know, coming here today. Uh, at the same time, I got a lot of things going on personally that's coming about. So it's great, you know. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. Let's talk about that. You just had another baby girl. Yes. I believe she's three months. Yes. So you have two girls now. Yes. First of all, what is that experience being a father again okay. for the second time now? It's all about accountability. It's, it's not about you know just having kids or it's all about being you know the legacy to your child you know so every decision you make regardless of playing football or working here or miscellaneous things you do here everything it revolves around accountability because you don't want to fail you know your kids and so that's that's what i drive that's my drive in regards to my oldest is natalia raven my little one is destiny ray mm -hmm. so i try to you know incorporate activities for both of them that's funny you said say it again the name is my three, my two-year-old, is, is her name is Natalia Raven. Natalia Raven. Yes. For a Ravens fan. <laughs> and the next one is? Uh, Destiny Ray. Destiny Ray. R-A-E. Yeah. You, you take this serious. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Now, just coming off winning the MVP, you beat, play, well, you beat players like Vic from Rep City, mm -hmm. Shannon from 99 Problems, and B-Roy from Super Friends. What was that feeling like of accomplishment when you found out that you were the winner beating those very talented guys? Um, you know, it's a lot of euphoria because, you know, I'm a Joe Schmo. Like, if you look at it, and I'm just talking about, like, when it comes to, like, everyone, like, unanimously. Like, I walked in, I walked in week two, you know, I caught two touchdowns versus IOD, you know, kind of check downs, you know, and people like, ah, oh, tall guy doing, you know, bare minimum. Then eventually, you know, the playbook started expanding, I started catching bombs, started putting double moves on people and stuff like that. And then eventually, the, the, the stuff that I invested, all the film study, all the workouts at the gym, and all the things I learned as I was going about came about, came to fruition. And so, you know, beating those um, great players, you know, was, was a big thing, especially with those guys who have notoriety, right. who've been around for X amount of years. And I just walked on to the scene, you know, with, you know. Now, you know, those are the nice questions. So now I'm going to be Stephen J on you yeah, right now. Absolutely, yeah. June 26th. You announced your retirement. Yes. August 9th, you said you're coming back. Yes. 
What was that? Let me say that again. June 26th. Yes. And then August 9th, you coming back. Yes. What, what, what was all that about? Um, I was emotionally drained. You know, I, I just hit 29 last week. Pretty much, I don't really have that much football left. Uh, previously, you know, especially after, uh, you know, the trial I had with Riot Squad, like, the opportunities that came about were not really foreseeably worthy. Um, it was like borderline after school program. Mm -hmm. You know, I came in there to be a, a piece to win a championship. I wanted to give my last two years because pretty much I may get transferred from the military or my fatherly duties may kick in into where I need to be there, you know, more often than not. And so I was emotionally drained and I just felt like if I don't get the opportunity to be a missing piece for a team to be, you know, to be a contender for a championship, then it's just pointless because then I could sit at home and watch Total Access and NFL Network and, and fulfill my crave for football like that. Even though deep down inside it burns because I'm not on the field doing what I do best. And so ultimately the opportunity came about in short notice and then eventually it was like a blessing in disguise because that was pretty much the only team I was interested in and so when the opportunity came about, that's when suddenly I announced my retirement. So you're not telling me that you didn't think Riot Squad was talented enough to help you win a championship? Not necessarily. Um, there was a lot of tentative variables that weren't really set in stone for it to be uh, something that you could continue on to build into going to the championship. You went to the Final Four. Yes, but, you know, I don't want to say it was fluky. I don't want to say it was not fluky, but there was a lot of variables that weren't potentially going to come back. Okay. And at the same time, you know, it's you, you don't want to be like the Calvin Johnson, you know, for seven years before Matthew Stafford comes and then you bum it with Matthew Stafford. And then now you just like so discouraged about wasting your time that you just want to walk away when, you know, and so that's my situation, basically. Some people say lose a dirty player. Some people say lose a diva. Why do people have these? thoughts about you well first of all dirty player I mean I, there's no there's nothing really that really illustrates that you know well I'm gonna jump and, in and before I, I, you finish I'm gonna beat you to that I'm all right a, I'll wait you because I've ahead. I coached against you this yes. summer and that's the only I mean and I have I have a play actually that they'll yes. see right now okay that you was and I'll of, illustrate that play right now for dirty. you so the play that you're referring to which is the only play that you probably have ammunition is basically a guy jumps around, he catches the pick, he puts several moves on everybody. Mind you, I was the one in the back end. So I, was, I came on an angle, and it was me versus a guy. Instinctually, I would never give, I'll give up a flag any day before a touchdown. Right. Guys, ju uh, you know, uh, juking left and right, and I kind of grabbed this jersey, and then I thought they was going to call it holding, the play was going to be dead. And so eventually, I kind of escorted him to the ground. No, su no, no suplex, no elbow throwing, no. Right. And, and, that's the, and then obviously the guy got emotional because I deprived him of a touchdown and the flag got involved. And then ultimately, we got the ball back at the 20-yard line because he, the penalty's offset. And so my play got us the ball back at the 20-yard line. So I made, I made a critical play for the opportunity to take away a touchdown from the defense as well as put my team in a better situation. What about the diva part? Leave it part, absolutely, because the principle is is that anything in life that you do successfully and that there's a product of that, like real tough talk, you take pride in that, you think right. you're the best, I think you're the best. I think all of y'all are the best, and, and, and in contrast to all the other, and, and you take pride in that, right? Yeah. If, if Stephen A. Smith is probably the best, he thinks he's the best. Right. You know, you feel like you could probably be better than him if you had the opportunity, and that's okay. the principle, is like if I feel I'm the best, because I contributed something, I did, I, my input, my, my study, my my provisions of what I invested, you know, on and off the field led to the accolade I received. And so obviously I am going to be, you know, I am going to be a diva because I take pride in that. At the same time, my favorite two players in NFL history, Terrell Owens and Ray Lewis. And those are the most emotional, prideful guys that I, that live inside of me when I play on the football field. Let's get to the now. Yes. Leave Rice squad. Yes. You join IOD. Okay. Rice Squad went to the Final Four, and they put you on the map because a lot of people Not don't know you've played on Gunners. Okay. Nobody even didn't know who Lou was, so we're gonna say that Riot Squad kind of put you. They showed your talent. They broadcast your talent. You know you had that talent, but they broadcast it. Why leave that team, and why pick why IOD? All right. So uh, primarily. Um, before, you know, UFL, and I'm not going to mention all the leagues, so that's not really relevant, I had a lot of notoriety. Not generally speaking, but, you know, there was a few guys that knew what I could do. 
Um, ultimately, yeah, Vaughn is my, one of my best friends. Vaughn, the quarterback from the government, one of my best friends of all time in the last seven years. He introduced me to Rough Touch Football. And so he put me on the map for just being involved and where I learned the mechanics of football. And so eventually I grew with him as a receiver, but then ultimately the environment wasn't really foreseeably like challenging enough to compete. And so I made a decision. And so the situation I arose with Riot Squad was eventually I played in the Turkey Bowl against Ramsey and Pig. You know, I don't want to say I abused them, but per se I had three touchdowns in one game on offense, two interceptions. I pretty much, you know, was doing what I needed to do. And then I got the audition to kind of be invited on Riot Squad in which the stuff that was unknown, unbeknownst to everyone, eventually evolved down the line. So, yes, Riot Squad was, a, I mean, is a contender, was a contender pertaining to, you know, what was there last year. But some of the variables that lead to being a contender this year are not blatant. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to kind of put a, flip a coin in the wishing well and just walk into an environment and where I only have two seasons left and I need to be a missing piece to a championship. So why, I, why IOD? IOD, in my opinion, um, and this is from a small sample size, but at the same time as a, a long sample size, because I played with them in another league. I, I played against them in another league, and you know, face value from the eye test. You look at this team; they come all uniform. They come. They, they, I just found out they practice. You know, every two times a week, if not more. They play in several leagues. It's it's one of the most professional teams that I witnessed. Face value. I mean, obviously, I don't, I'm not. In, um, I don't know too much about the TFL in general, in regards right. to other teams. But face value. I've been watching this team for a long time, and I've been watching some of the players. They have players at every position that are competent enough to get the job done. Uh, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of teams in NFL, and UFL that I say like 80% of the people playing safety shouldn't be at safety. You know, hikers are usually they put the, the worst guy. You know, unless you're a competitive team that has like a designated hiker that's going to really eat at that position, they're not going to have like competent people in every level. And so I felt like IOD gave me that chance to be a missing piece because they have competent people at every level. They have two great quarterbacks. They have great receivers that run routes. They have, very, uh, they have great IQ, great awareness. And I'm not saying I'm a missing piece to them because they have a lot of accolades beyond you know, what I can contribute. But at the same time, I reached out. I, I, I kind of was humble about the experience, the opportunity, and it came about. And to me, it was, it was a blessing in disguise because this is what I've been thriving for, the opportunity to be a missing piece of the championship. You and Ramsey were practically up until the Final Four game, unstoppable. Game-winning drives, game-winning plays, killed him in UFL with Rice Squad. You played with Ramsey in EHS on the Shockers. It didn't work out. What happened? And what was the difference between Riot playing with Ramsey on Riot versus playing with Ramsey on the Shockers? Um, so the difference is face value. Uh, Ramsey was wasn't you know running the team on the Riot Squad. So yeah, he has his own plays, he has his own philosophy, but then ultimately he has to report back to Pitt. you know yeah. And right. so then I, at, the, at that point you you get him like, kind of like policed on what you want to do, what mm -hmm. you should do, and and ultimately there's like a chain of command. And so in Riot Squad, I mean in Riot Squad, you know I gave suggestions right. like when I first came about. Um, I didn't really have saves. I came in there, but me and Ramsey go way back to several other leagues and where I led the league in touchdowns. I had four touchdowns a game and, you know, we won championships in, in other boroughs and all that. And so, yeah, so it, face value, it was a great opportunity. Like, you know, it was Tetris and just straight blocks coming down. And, but the principle is, is that he was getting policed, right? And so I came and I said, hey, this safety is garbage. This safety has no fundamentals. I'm not just talking about garbage. Like, he has no fundamentals. I run past him, and then he turns his hips. I'm faster than him. You lead it to the spot, I get there. If I don't get there, I walk off the team, kick me out, whatever the case may be. I gave him that accountability. And so all, over time, you know, he started trusting me. I started trusting him, him, and then eventually we built from there. And then Pigs was supportive and, and so on. Um, in EHS, on the Shockers, you know, there was nobody policing him. You know, it was him. And his team, and I respect that, you know, I'm, I'm part of, you know, the culture that, of that team. But my suggestions weren't really as fluid as what they were before. And you figure, because EHS was after Riot Squad, and so you figure what worked, what paid the bills, what foreseeably was the reason why you got to where you got to. Not because of me. Which is going, it sounds like you're saying basically what worked in, in UFL, which was getting you the ball. 
Not necessarily, but those weren't the opportunities that were happen, uh, happening in EHS. And then ultimately it turned into an after school program on my end. And I mm. use the term after school program because That's funny. It, it, it came off of, as recreational. And then I, I, I'm so emotionally invested in everything I do. You know, I'm prideful about serving my country. I'm prideful of being a parent. I'm prideful and, and doing the things, the, the most fundamental things in, in life. And so me investing my health, because ultimately I have a knee injury that's kind of undecided right now. I don't know my situation, but, you know, that's my situation with that. Um, you know, I only have two years left. And at the same time, we, we're trying to win a championship. And so that wasn't happening. And I wasn't featured and, and things weren't really like foreseeable to like really take it to the next level because we weren't winning. And you're throwing to people that are not really as competent as what they should be mm -hmm. in that situation. So I got, I got upset and I decided, you know, to. I, to, spoke, I spoke to a few of your teammates on Riot Squad. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a few of the, the words that they gave me. They gave me competitive. Another teammate gave me passion but the other one was kind of interested you got to get to know him now that That's could be true. taken as positive or negative what are your thoughts on that particular response that's definitely my you know because a lot of people for example like when i play in that after school program setting that i feel like there's potential like i scream at people i scream at you i tell you you shouldn't be turning around playing middle linebacker you should be getting a sack at hiker because it's already going at four minutes four and a half mississippi if, if, the, if the count is five you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't be turning your hips if the, if, the, if the receiver's running full speed. Don't turn your hips when he's hip to hip. Backpedal, turn your hips early, play the ball. And so fundamentals like that, if I feel like I'm screaming at you about something you should know, it comes off as like I'm like micromanaging you and you're supposed to be competent at that. So some people take it as, you know, like, damn, this guy's like talking smack. Like, you know, and obviously if me and you are the same we cut it from the same cloth, like we competitive, we know there's potential in us and we need each other to pull it out of us, then you understand that there's potential in where we could grow at the situation at hand. I have one more question, okay. but I'm gonna throw you a quick bonus question. I hear you saying, you, you, you get into it, tell guys where to be at, you say this, you should be rushing on this count. You basically kind of was like a leader kind of took on the leadership role on, on the field. I, I wouldn't say that. One of the leaders. Let's say one of the leaders. I wouldn't even say that because that's subjective to who's allowing me that responsibility. Okay. Because ultimately, like, there was situations that I feel like that person should be there, this person should be there, this person should be there. And if I'm critical enough, it's like, for example, if you work at Subways and all your job is to pull out the bread out the oven, you pull out the, have a handful of lettuce and I pull out the cookies with the bag and you can't pull out the bread and I can't pull out, like, you shouldn't be there. I'm glad you, you said know? that. that that's, that's great, because that leads to my bonus question. Yes. Everybody actually got to do their job. Absolutely. And be accountable. You're, 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 you were an MVP candidate. Now you won the MVP, but at the time you were an MVP candidate. Final four game. No catches. You're the MVP. Okay. You're telling me how these guys got to do their job. But you, who was practically the best player on your team last season, had no catches mm. against a defense who has some of the smallest corners in the league. They, they're not, they know Ben, but don't break, but you are a game breaker. You had no catches. Who is that on? That's on Ramsey. What responsibility do you take for practically not performing in a game to go to a championship? Okay, well, first off, I'm not a volume guy. I'm a big play guy. So I'm not the Jarvis Landry of, like, the UFL. Like, I catch bombs. I catch things that put you in field position, right? So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll run the intermediate routes here and there. I'll run the post just to expose other people to get open. In regards to that situation, yeah, I had no catches, but that doesn't mean it's not because I, I was a recipient of being shut down. I had a touchdown gift wrapped. I ran that post over the top. The safety collapsed down. The, the, the free safety didn't run across the field. So you pretty much had 25 yards of real estate and where you just like punt, punt it right into that area. And I would have had a walk-in touchdown. Second touchdown was thrown late. I had Joe B. If he didn't throw, if he would have thrown like three seconds earlier, I would have jumped over Joe and had the touchdown. Uh, besides that, everything else was just me being a decoy, pulling people out of zones. Uh, Amir probably had a, a, a nice 50, 50 yard pass, you know, if opportunities would have came about and where maybe reads would have been met. 
But ultimately, me having zero catches is not a reflection of, you know, I didn't do enough or I did too little. It's more about the opportune, the opportunistic, you know, opportunities didn't come about. But the principle is, is that I'm not a reflection of success. I'm a reflection of the team's success. And so ultimately, if, yeah, if, if Pig would have caught the touchdown, I would have picked up Pig and whatever the case may be, it came down to me. I had to make the play. And it doesn't change nothing. You know, it's Ramsey ran, scrambled out and he threw the perfect pass. He put me in position to ultimately make the play. So that's what it comes down to. Let's talk about Jeremy. Plays for YMM. You guys battled this past season. You even admit purposely trying to take him out of his game with excessive Absolutely. trash talk. You played that team just recently in City Island. Yes. There was an incident that transpired. Tell us what happened. Well, before the incident, you know, I'll tell you this. A lot of people have perceptions about me and Jeremy. Jeremy and me and Jeremy are like pretty much the same player. He's super emotional. He cares enough. I'm the same way. Um, when two guys of that magnitude collide, there's going to be it's, it's steel sharp and steel. You know, it's like Ravens versus Steelers. But at the end of the day, you know, a lot of people don't understand this, but at the end of the day, like a Ravens Steeler game, they shake hands, they go out to eat, they, they do a lot of these like friendly things. I mean, we don't have that, that, that uh, relationship, but ultimately we understand it subjectively. We don't have to communicate that. Now, in regards to the situation that happened in City Island, uh, right before the situation, you know, there was a play, he pushed me out of bounds, and he kicks me in my shin. It was like the, the most, worst pain I've ever had because <laughs> he kicked me like, like right in my shin bone. But then eventually, you know, I got mad or whatever. But then at the end of the game, uh, we was down, we was down, what, five, I believe? It was like 30, 34, 28 or something like that. And then there was a pass that was thrown high uh, for one of the receivers, I don't remember. And then Tim and Jeremy collided and where Tim jumped up and then Jeremy kind of went low for some reason or he probably lost his footing or something happens. I wasn't really focused. And apparently he caught a knee to the temple and caught a concussion and he landed on his neck and it was just a very nasty scene. And then he went to like a mild seizure, disorientation. He was just in bad shape. And, um, and what did you do? And then I, I rendered aid. I mean, that's, I'm a humanitarian. I have a heart about, regardless of who you are or whatever the case may be, I rendered aid uh, because at the end of the day, I love him as a brother in football, just like I love everybody, everybody here, just like I love everybody in the field because we are related by virtue of football. And we all need to take care of each other because that's what we came here to do, to distract ourselves from all the demons outside of football and we try to run away from. And so I understand his passion about football. I understand, I know he understands mine and we all understand each other. So I'm not gonna leave a brother, you know, especially I'm qualified to render aid and, and I, I have good faith about people's safety and stuff like that. I decided to render aid and ultimately try to contribute to his health and his well-being. What was you able to do? Um, well. He, he caught a mouth seizure. His, his tongue was kind of like retracting in his throat. So I kind of like laid him over, cleared his windpipe. Um, then I picked up, uh, he had heat exhaustion. He had a, a neck sprain. I don't, I don't know of a neck sprain, but the way he landed looks very awkward. And then right. he had a concussion. Uh, so usually when you have a concussion and especially in that situation, you have heat exhaustion. So I pulled up his shirt. He had sweatpants. I pulled him up as high as I can. I screamed for like towels, like wet towels and, and stuff like ice. So I put ice on his neck. I put a towel on his back, whole towel. I tried to like get his legs ventilated and um, I tried to talk to him. But then, you know, I don't have that, or I don't have that rapport with him. And so thank God, like Santana stepped in, which is, which was like a beautiful moment because then I don't know if they relate or not, but it was just like one of the, like, it, it was a powerful moment right. where he stepped in and he spoke to him and he calmed him down. And it was, you know, that's something that I wish I had, you know, for my, was a, my brother left me and um, I have a lot of family members that weren't really in my life. And so that was a beautiful thing. And I, I applaud him for that, which helped me out to do my end because he woke up at one point and, you know, he's seen me and, and you know, <laughs> you know, we don't have the best relationship on the field. Right. And so, you know, he suppressed that by, you know, talking to him and then ultimately, um, you know, he came about around 10 minutes after and, you know. Then the ego started kicking. He wanted to get up, and I'm like, "Man, stay down. You know, we, we need you to kind of be assessed by EMS and stuff like that." And so ultimately, EMS came, and um, they did what they had to do, and that's what it came down to. I mean, all the guys was thankful to you. Um, they sent you a lot of shout-outs on online and stuff like that. It was definitely a great thing that you did. Now let's talk about this. And let's wrap this up with: How do you think people are gonna view Lou now after that incident? 
Remember, a lot of people had all these thoughts of you, but after something like that, where you have to show emotion, you have to show, you know, you have to step out of character that people don't see because you're so passionate about the game. Do you think that that would change people's conception of you? Uh, I don't think so, because unless you came with a bias or a prejudice about me before the fact, you should embrace everyone without that bias and just understand them. Obviously, if you're looking from, from a film and you're seeing me probably like, you know, maybe talk smack or maybe on Instagram, you probably see me do a double move on someone or post some funny video. It's just me just being creative and just, you know, uh, it doesn't really illustrate me to be, you know, X, Y, or Z. And so once you get to know me, you'll understand. That okay, well, great interview. We wanna thank you for being here with us. We're gonna congratulate you again for winning the MVP of the UFL. Congratulate you on the new new baby. Um, wish you good luck playing with IOD because you're gonna have a lot of people watching you now because you're supposed to help take this team to the next level or what's they what they picked you up in the beginning. Um, last thing I want to ask, um, are you a Ghost fan or are you a Stephen J fan? <laughs> we always like to throw that out. You can be honest. You can say in front of him, I am a Stephen J fan. But who, who, you can't say both. Okay, I'll give you this. Um, there's boxers and brawlers, right? Okay, okay. Some people prefer the art of boxing. Right. Some people like knockouts. Right. So that's the situation that I'm in right now. Right. Because it's like, you have the personality, he has the analytical experience and vice versa right. sometimes. And so it's hard to really like sit there and say, hey, I like you or I like him or vice versa. Politically correct. But there's yeah. moments, like those right. moments, like in those videos, y'all say, oh, the wind caught the ball right. or coincidences. Like coincidences get old after a while. If I right. catch the pick or I'm jumping around, like in like the, the play that Amir tips it and so-and-so tips it. Right. And, like, I jumped the route from across the field. Right. You, nobody said, oh, good play by Lou. He actually, like, jumped the route from across the field. You know, so that's something, or, like, you know, the wind caught the ball. I was facing the football the whole time. If you mm. look at your film, two-thirds of the linebackers in the whole league, not even facing the ball. Mm -hmm. I never turn my back unless the ball goes over my head. Look at the film. So the principle is that maybe, uh, you know, <laughs> y'all yeah, both chip away at stuff like right. that. But, you know, I would say hone in on the analytical uh, – uh, you know, I guess plays and that's it. <laughs> I, think, I think that was kind of a shot fire. No, no, like both yeah, both yeah. Shots fired. I would, I would like to say shots fired. We're gonna thank you for being here with us. Like I, I appreciate said, it. thank you for coming down. Present arms. First, first, first interview that we had live here on. You know, I think it went pretty well. Very good. He had it very good. He did not have a a, a, a questionnaire. He did not know what I was gonna ask him, and he did very well. Very good. when I try to come at him with a little bit. The guys, the guy was pretty good. I'm very impressed. But yeah, gonna thank y'all for being here with us. We're gonna see you on the site. Thank Lou, MVP, reigning MVP. Let's see what he's gonna do if he can repeat that. We'll see. Go thank y'all. Thanks for being here. Real tough talk. On behalf of me, uh, my producer, Ghost, everybody. Thanks a lot. We're gonna see y'all soon on the site. Thanks. See y'all later. Take care. All right. Okay. I know exactly what you're about to say. Exactly. I mean, listen, obviously, we're not going to go over the whole interview. Yeah. But a lot of things kind of stood out to me. I, I, I just want to know what he meant when he said this. It was like the teams I offered him contracts, I guess, offered him spots to play mm -hmm. was kind of like an after school program. Hmm. What, 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 what does that mean? What are you saying? That it, it, it's just like a recreational team. It's not a team that's really there that can compete. He wasn't trying to say that. He basically said that. Yeah. So that's a disrespect to any team that offered him a contract. Listen, hopefully he's not thinking about going back to those teams because I doubt that they're looking forward to having someone like that that criticized them after giving them the opportunity to play on that team. I, like I said, those are big bridges definitely burn, but I don't think he's concerned about any of that. And then if you look, listen to the stuff he said about Riot Squad, I don't want to say that it's a fluke. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what you're saying. Yeah. You said it was a fluke. <laughs> so he was saying, well, I didn't really want to say it's a fluke and yeah. this and this and that. He was saying that. So yeah. it's like he didn't believe that this team was really able to get to where they, they got. But there's more to it than that language. Well, I, I, you got to read in between the words. And yes, 
it's, you know, painting the exact picture that I know you have in your head right now. But he's pretty much saying, you know, when you say after school program, <laughs> when you say stuff like, um, I'm not going to say this, but anytime you hear that type of you're saying what you're, you're about to yeah. say. It. Yeah. So my thing is all of these teams, he feels that this is probably what they were if he were not there. If he's not able to con contribute the way that he feels he can to this team, if he's not going to be the one that's going to be the main thing, the showstopper, the person who everything is centered around, they're not going away. And that's pretty much why he said this team was an after-school program because I'm not be benefiting from it. I'm just here. I'm just wasting time. I'm having fun. But it's nothing that's going to get me anywhere. Then he said basically – guys wasn't coming back now when i asked him about the situation first about the situation with ramsey he said that you know ramsey was kind of controlled in riot squad mm -hmm. when ramsey had his own team ehs it didn't work because ramsey you know didn't have anybody really in control i think he was more look what worked in ufl mm -hmm. i'm your best player on this shockers team why am i not getting the ball all the time and 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 this is one of the most selfish players that I've ever seen in touch football. I mean, listen, if you listen to the things the guy said, when I asked him about the game versus 99 problems, he didn't just jump on and say, well, we had an opportunity to get to a championship if we beat him. We didn't play well and we lost. He blamed everybody else but himself. Mm -hmm. He basically blamed everybody. Then if you looked at the beginning of the interview when he was like, He's a Joe Schmo, and, and, and he's not a big-time player. But then he gives you his stats on what he did against certain teams. So you're, you're a selfish player because the whole interview, he practically talked about himself. Practically. That's exactly what he did. But I'm going to say something I know you're not going to agree with. Here we go. I like everything that he did in that interview. Blasphemy. Everything that he did in that interview. Only because when you are trying to put yourself out there – when you're trying to gain this, some, this attention that, um, that people need to pay attention to you, when you're trying to make a name for yourself, this is exactly how you do it. By showing your accolades, by um, you know, displaying your accolades, all the things that you've done, by letting everybody know, listen, I'm a problem when, on, when I'm on the field. He's not the only person that does that. When they're on the field, they let you know they are a problem. I've heard Rico tell people off on the field that he's a problem when he's on the field. Wow. I hear Jeremy calling people out on the field with, on YMM. I know that Alex, even though he may not be the biggest, you know, loudest person on the field, he plays like he knows that he is the, the, um, the main factor on his team when he's out there. Lim All of these guys have their own personality, but they show everybody and they don't hide the fact that they feel that they're the best. That's BS. And I'm going to just call it BS. Let me, let me read what he put after his interview with us. This is amazing. We wait until after your interview. So you mm -hmm. must have realized what you said. Knew I was going to comment on this. what he said. I would like to give the greatest shout out to Riot Squad entire family as an individual for our season last, last year. And the great experience that transpired throughout the course of the season. There were a lot of passion for the game, struggles, a lot of grit and adversity that we overcame as a group of men that evidently took us to the depths of our potential. Although we evidently fell short in the conference final and I decided to part ways into a different <laughs> I hold this ex experience close to my heart. <sighs> I'm just not going to read the whole thing. I speak in good faith. Everything we've gone through. Wish you good more. Thanks again. Please, if I've got to tag you, I can't find your IG. You can read the whole thing. We just put it up on screen. That why was, Why that put that up after the interview? Because you know you killed them in the interview. Mm -hmm. You talked about this team. Basically, you said IOD was the only team you wanted to play with. As y'all saw on the video, we're showing it now him with IOD. He went to IOD. Mm -hmm. So he bashed the team that he played with, bashed every other team in the league. Now, let's talk about the team he joined, mm -hmm. ILD. I understand that. You know, that's a great organization. And you get to either play with Slasher, last year's offensive player of the year, yeah. or you get to play with the previous year, 
I, the bad man who won the quarterback of the year. Yeah. Great pickup. Lewis not going to be an MVP on this team. First of all, the last MVP to leave the following year was Bishop. Mm -hmm. The 2013-2014 season, he won the MVP with Reckless, left Reckless to go to Carver. Won a championship with Carver the following year, 2013-2014 season. He made the All-Star team. Mm -hmm. He wasn't an MVP. Lou is about Lou. There is okay. no way you're going to see the same Lou that was able to do whatever he want with Riot be like down IOD. And what's going to happen is mm. he's going to do what he did on the Shockers. He's going to take his football and leave because he's not going to be the major option on this team. But I'm going to say this. And if Lou is a person that knows exactly where he is and knows the opportunity he has playing with IOD... I think that he will be fine. I think that he's going to rein in that, you know, personality. Hopefully so. Because I'm not saying it's a bad, you know, thing to put yourself out there and say I'm the best. But this is the opportunity you've been looking for. But why do you think he's going to do My thing is, in terms of you pointing out Bishop being, you know, a, a former MVP and then he went to um, Carver and yeah. he wasn't an MVP. But remember, if you remember Bishop... Bishop was a person that deserved his own reality show. Yes. He, he was a person who was also all about himself. True. He was always talking about, I'm going to be MVP again. Yeah. I'm going for that MVP. Well, he didn't get the MVP, but he had an all-star season. Five touchdowns, three sacks, one interception. So that was an all-star year, and his team won the championship. So, again, that's the whole goal that he's striving for. To win a championship. So at the end of the day, even if he doesn't make um, win MVP, as long as he have um, s numbers that will actually show that he was a big contributor to the team. But why do you think he's going to contribute on, 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 on IOD? Like how, I mean, what, what, what facts do you have? Why do you think not? Well, let's start with you and I will, I will respond. Again, he's a prima donna. Okay. He admitted it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a part of his charm. That's what made him better. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? He's not going to be able to do that on IOD. Slash is not having it. Mm -hmm. Adi's not having it. Coach Tony's not having it. Their main guys are not having that. You can be the star there, but you're coming to help us get to a championship. Now, it worked with Pams. But Pams was a championship organization mm -hmm. already. And they came in the UFL and they won three chips. Yeah. Eventually... Bishop left, if yeah. you recall, because he didn't like the role he was put in. Mm -hmm. Lou is going to leave this team. He's not going to get the football the way he got it on Riot. But I'm going to say this. He was Riot's major weapon. But then I'm going to say this. If he, and again, I'm not criticizing him for his mentality and everything, but there's a time and place for it. He's on a team that's potential to win a championship okay. in IOD. They've always been a contender since they joined the UFL. And they're always contenders no matter where they go. You're saying that he's not going to be a, a big figure on the he team. He was with the Gunners the year before Riot, and nobody knew who he was. He went to Riot and dominated, did his thing, playing both ways. But you're saying that this season he's not going to no, have No, it's not going to happen season. on IOD. But I'm saying... Look at the numbers on somebody else that creeped up out of nowhere from IOD. He was there one year, and, and I'm talking about Eddie, who was the bad man, how you call him, his main target two years ago. He had six touchdowns and three extra points. So he was the main scorer on this IOD team, and he came out of nowhere. Right. So he should have won most improved. Yeah, he could have won most improved player, but unfortunately, he had to go against Macho, who pretty much did everything for that Violators team that okay. year. But Eddie was able to shine on a team that have established offensive players already. The the main two players that were scoring on IOD was Costa and Jesus. Okay, they were top in touchdowns yes. on the team. And then you have Slasher and Matrix, who was their main defenders on defense. Right. Slasher had three interceptions. Matrix had two. On offense, Costa had four touchdowns. Jesus had four. Lou had six touchdowns. So that's better than both of these guys already. Okay. And then you have four, four interceptions. That's better than Slasher and Matrix already. 
So you're getting a guy whose numbers is better than everybody that's on their team that year. So you're bringing that onto your team, and then you're adding that to the 20 touchdowns that Slasher was able to throw last season that got him quarterback of the year. Okay. And you add six touchdowns to that. And that's only because Ramsey was throwing the ball to other people, even though Lou was their main guy. But if Slasher's able to connect with Lou the way I think he will, I think they're going to both benefit from them playing together. It's all up on Lou and what he truly wants. If it's all about him and he just wants to shine and be this, you know, like... Then it's not going to work. The, the prima donna, I think that it's going to hurt. But as long as you do it and, st and still not letting it affect your game and not affecting the game of everybody else around you, I think that they'll be fine. Other than that, I like that he's putting himself out there. The only thing is, we all know with football... When you put yourself out there, you, you put a target on your back. So now he has a bullseye on his back. They're coming after him. Hopefully, they use this to their, advent to this, to their advantage, and Lou is prepared for this. But I think knowing how to, the way he talks, I think that there's no way that he can't be prepared, prepared, um, prepared for this. We're going to wrap up the segment. I mean, I hear what you're saying. I think Riot, he was the only guy that, they, that Ramsey really threw to. If you look at the touchdowns, um, Big E, I, I hate that I called him that. <laughs> he had two touchdowns. Julio had two touchdowns. You know, um, Pig had three touchdowns. Mm -hmm. You know, Tone had three touchdowns. So, you know, uh, JP didn't ball the way he was supposed to no. because Ramsey didn't throw them more yes. in the end zone. And he found him outside the end zone, but not in the end zone. And then you got you got um, this guy, um, Lou, jumping up to six. Mm -hmm. That is practically... You figure they scored 131 points. Lou had 20, 27% mm -hmm. of those points he scored. 27% mm -hmm. out of 131. That's yeah. pretty good. That's not happening with IOD. So I hope he's prepared and he can sit down with the grind of knowing, first of all, he's not playing defense. They're not going to put him on that defense. He's going to be a one-way player. And when he's not getting the football, let's see what happens in the season. Because I don't think it works. I like the fact that... You know, um, that he was honest. Mm -hmm. I hate what he said in the interview. I think it was disrespectful. You liked it. You liked his honesty. I think it was disrespectful. I think he disrespected the Riot Squad team. And then he tried to clean it up with that poor excuse for a shout out when he should have did this before. Listen, that was, I'm going to just say this. That, le that message that he put up, that was a breakup letter that you send a person after you got caught cheating. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. You already moved on to the next person, and now you want to break up with this person. Well, we're going to have to That's see. That's what happened. We're going to see the what happens. The thing is, listen, I like the controversy. I like the, the smack talk. I like that he's coming out and saying how he feels. I like the because it adds to the game. Yeah. I want to see what happens when these two well, teams face each other. Remember his two favorite players? You one said, of the best said, leaders in the game. Yes. Ray Lewis and Terrell Owens. One of the most selfish players in football history. Yeah. Is one of the guys he loved. So it's apparent why he plays hard. We never say he don't play hard. He's got to yeah. give 100%, which he probably got on Ray Lewis' side. But he does also love the ball. He also loves talking about himself, mm -hmm. which is the T.O. side. So we're going to have to see which one shows up coming this UFL season. We're going to get to our next segment where we talk about the free agents. We're going to be right back on Real Tough Talk. We'll be right back.